So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to see the room almost full. I uh, didn't know this subject was so popular. But today I'll be presenting my thesis that is the use of data science tools for assessing inland water surface and quality through high resolution Sentinel-2 remote sensing images. And to start, I'd like to give you some context about the global water challenge. Well, uh, water covers almost 70% of the world's surface, but most of it is salt water in the oceans, 98%. And from the remaining, almost 2% is locked in the ice caps or in the ground. And the remaining that is available as fresh water for consumption is just a very small fraction from this water. And if you look at the right side, on the demand side, according to the projections by the United Nations Development Program, uh, the world population can reach 10 billion people by 2050. And that brings other pressures, for example, irrigation increase that is increasing a, in a rate of 14% by year. And of course, we have other uh, pressures from this increasing population in water toilets caused by contaminants and effective waste management, time exchange, etc. So we have to take in mind that most of these water related issues are not driven by an actual lack of water, but they result for poor and inefficient water resource governance. And that's from a report from UNESCO. And to achieve a better sustainable resource management, it's essential to incorporate better measurement and monitoring into decision making frameworks. What is the problem? The problem is that decision makers usually rely on functional measurements from conventional field monitoring. These for water quality has a lot of shortcomings from uh, like, for example, high cost and time needed to collect and analyze these laboratory samples. Sometimes it's not feasible if we reach remote regions or difficult access regions. And usually these punctual measures, they do not represent the spatial temporal variation that we have in the inland waters. And in this context, uh, remote sensing for Earth observation can be a very good complement for traditional ground-based surveys. The problem is that even though it dates back almost 50 years, it started in the 70s, uh, we see a slow evolution in inland water compared to oceanic and terrestrial applications. Although the recent advances in satellites in terms of spatial uh, uh, spectrum and temporal resolution and the growing number of studies about inland waters, it's still constrained in very localized scales and they do not translate into operational products in regional or global scale, which is crucial for the decision makers. And that's exactly where my thesis comes in. It comes to, to fill this gap between uh, what they have in the advance of satellites and the need for large scale monitoring available for, for the researchers and the community. So the main object of the thesis is to provide a comprehensive framework that can be replicated in different regions of the globe for inland water quality and quantity through remote sensing imaging. To do that, we are going to make use of existing methodologies and propose some new advance towards robustness, scale, and automation. So these three words I'm going to use throughout the, the thesis to, to, to see if we can address correctly these points. And we divided the, the thesis in three main axes. The first one is on supervised and automatic water budget detection. The second is improve the classification of optical water types for inland waters, parameters retrieval and satellite based large scale monitoring and analysis. And in the end, we have a case study to demonstrate the use of everything, all this methodology that we, we developed by analyzing the trending of water quality parameters during the drop events that hit Brazil in 2021. So if I had to summarize the thesis in just one slide, it would be this one where we start from the high resolution uh, image from Sentinel-2 because it meets the requirements of spatial and temporal resolution to achieve analysis of water quantity and water quality. And here in different colors, we have the three axes, main axes that we have selected to go deeper and to do the research the axis one, where we have the water pixel detection, and we have other things uh, together with this main task here to, to mask the undesired pixels in the scene. We have axis two, uh, optical water classification. This was motivated basically to improve the inversion algorithms because of the difficulty to have one algorithm calibrated for different regions and different water types. 
Unfortunately, I'm not presenting access to today in this presentation because of restrictions of time. And access three generalization and analysis where we put everything uh, or try to put everything together to provide water quantity and water quality analysis in a regional scale, something uh, that's uh, towards uh, the decision maker to, to use this, this information. So starting with water pixel detection, this is just a, a sample uh, a picture of places where we have tested the, the algorithm. Uh, afterwards, I'm going to show some slides with examples and results that we obtained from the methodology. And what is the challenge? The, the challenge is that inland waters, they are affected by a lot of different factors. Basically, the constituents that exist within these waters, like chlorophyll, suspended solids or organic matter. Uh, this is an example of 13 basins that we have uh, in Brazil, and they are uh, affected mostly by the suspended solids that exist in between. So it's difficult for us to develop a methodology specific to distinguish all these types of water and to identify that these are water. It can also uh, change according to bottom material in the case of shallow waters, observation conditions like sun target and sensor geometry. And the most important in, in this slide is to, to keep in mind that operational masks that, uh, put, that they provide freely the land cover for this image from, from, from Sentinel-2, we have some uh, uh, large scale processors, the most important Sentinel-2 core. Uh, so, sorry once again, and we are going to restart from here. Let me just thank you. Okay. So, as I was saying in, in this slide, so we did a lot of experiments to try to find the best combinations of spectral indices and reflectance bands, and we compared the results with the main processors that are available for Sentinel-2 imagery. Uh, and to validate everything, we, uh, I used the data set provided by KNES. It had 15 scenes, uh, 1,200 square kilometers of water surface and 12 million of water pixels. They are basically 15 scenes in uh, France, nine different regions of France making because some of them they had two dates in summer and winter to, to combine uh, uh, scenes with uh, snow and uh, yeah. So the results comparing the clustering with the trash holding, we can see that uh, the clustering, different combinations of clustering, they could outperform even the best trash holding procedure and the, the trash holding here is not the normal Otsu Masking, it's a modified version that it's proposed in the paper that uh, uh, we published. Uh, for example, we had a kappa uh, uh, going through all the scenes. We had a kappa of 0.87 instead of 0.8, with a much lower standard deviation of 0.09 to 0.2. And even if we look in these scatter plots, the red lines represent what would be the result using one, one uh, uh, reflectance, one spectral indice as threshold. This is a scene in Alsace, and what we can see here is that we would have a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives if we use just one 
uh, reflectance in uh, spectral lens. So we could improve uh, much the results in this regard. Considering the performance where we assessed the water buddies by distinct size, what we can see is that, for example, between one and 10 hectares, only clustering and can add, that is another threshold, we were able to provide a kappa score above 0.8. And in the smaller size range, for example, 0.5 to 1 and below 0.5, the clustering outperformed the second best can add by 7 and 34%. Percent respectively. So we had a, a huge improvement if you consider smaller water bodies using this methodology. And another finding is that amongst uh, the processors F mask outperformance and core and Maya in all size classes. So uh, this article is published uh, in Remote Sense Not Environments, a publication from 2000 and December 2020 or January 2021. Here is the graphical abstracts of the paper where uh, we show the whole process, the original image, the random sampling, the agglomerative clustering, the identification of the water cluster using the sampling, the samples, then the generalization of maybe based the water mask, the final water mask for, for the scene. Uh, I have published also two articles as co-author, the first one as third co-author with a colleague from Ines and Santiago Canalupi where we tested compared the Sentinel-1 to Sentinel-2, surface water detection in regional and reservoir levels. The results are here. Uh, it's difficult uh, to see because of the resolution, but in, in blue, we have the ground proof. In yellow, we have the optical, and in green, we have the values from radar from Sentinel-1. And we can see that radar, it's suboptimal. It does not give us the the full, when, when the reservoirs are full, uh, it cannot represent correctly, it misses a lot of pixels. That can also be seen. In this picture, we have the true color of the Milian Reservoir, the optical, this is the occurrence map, and the radar. For, uh, and we see it misses a lot of uh, water because of the surrounding vegetation in this reservoir. And we have also another publication with uh, other colleagues were uh, proposed by the European Space Agency, where they did an intercomparison among different methodologies, and we tested them on five very challenging sites for this task in Greenland, Colombia, Mexico, Zambia, and Gabon. So we had several teams working together or trying to show the, their best methodologies. So 2,000 images were processed to produce 120 monthly maps in full resolution of 10 meters. And water detect performance as the best, considering just optical. And we don't, another advantage is that we don't use any ancillary data, such as DEM or urban regions, that the other optical uh, methodology they used to improve their accuracy. And just to uh, represent some samples, this is a scene in Bordeaux, where we achieved a cap of 0.98 for the whole scene. And zooming in these red squares, we have. Uh, the, these samples where we can see that we had uh, colors, uh, water with very different colors, charted with sediments or chlorophyll, and it worked uh, flawlessly in this in this case. This is another example in Zambia, where we have an overall accuracy of 0.91. The accuracy is different because this is from the, the paper of proposed by the, the spatial agency. And instead of ass, uh, assessing the accuracy for the whole thing, they selected smaller Patches, for example, this is one patch where they assessed the results. So it was assessed just in small patches in the scene, but you also achieved a high accuracy in this case. And it was very challenging because we had a lot of wetlands in, in the region. These are other samples, for example, Greenland with overall accuracy of 0.91, considering just summer because in winter we have just snow. In Greenland, it's not possible to see anything. Mexico, this is a very uh, glinted lake that we have in uh, Mexico, so it's also possible to, to detect. And another paper that is under review is comparing S2 with sharpening the planet scope in three meters to check their performances. And in the Matthews correlation coefficient, they almost match the results. Uh, so that was, we were trying to assess 
if uh, uh, we have a much improvement using sharper uh, sharpened image in, in instead of the 20 meters of the Sentinel-2 because of the SWIFT sensors. So the conclusions for, for this part, uh, we would say that we address the robustness because clustering is a significant improvement over traditional methods. So we had a mean cap uh, 0.87 instead of 0.8 from the best uh, threshold. And that was true, especially for smaller water bodies. Uh, we address the automation because it doesn't require any training or calibration and it doesn't use any arbitrary selected thresholds and scale because the subsampling approach that uh, we use it makes it viable for very high resolution seats. Other findings is that MNDWI should be preferred when using simple thresholding, providing the best, the best uh, results. Among them, two processors, FMS performed better than Centupor and Maya. And we still have issues with snow and shadows that should be treated in pre-processing. <coughs> and ab about water detect, it's uh, available freely. Uh, the code as a package in GitHub, so anyone, any researcher can just download it. And uh, there's already training on the water detect package uh, going on. So uh, it's a package that everyone can contribute and we can advance. So now talking about the axis three, the generalization analysis and case study. First, why we selected that as a case study? Uh, 2021, Brazil faced the, one of the worst drought. On June 1st, the National Water Agency, National Water and Sanitation Agency of Brazil declared the drought emergency on a on a hydrographic region called Paraná. The region is economic key to Brazil hydroelectric industrial production, and this river reached its lowest level in nearly 80 years. And why we selected this? Well, because of the importance of the drought, and also because the 16 most important reservoirs in the region were monitored daily by the Brazilian authorities. And we did the case study to address two main issues here. The first one is to address technical challenge towards scalability, because we have a high, as I'm going to show you, we have a high spatial coverage. Uh, to to work on and to assess the second objective is to assess the impact on the region as a whole, statistically considering also the unmonitored reservoirs and rivers because 16 is just a part of it. I'm going to show you that we have a lot of reservoirs with different sizes that should be addressed and should be monitored correctly. So this is just a comparison between this draw of 2000 Kenyan with two other major draws that occurred in Brazil, in the, basically the same region. For this comparison, we used the water extents of the 60 major reservoirs and the daily data and stage curves. So we download the stage curves from everything. These reservoirs, they represent 70% of the total water surface in the region. <clears throat> and what we can see uh, here is that we have uh, in black the long term average. So we have a huge drop in long term average, but important here. In purple is the drought of 2021, so we remained uh, below in, in surface area. We remained below, sorry, we remained below the other drought during the whole period, during the whole hydrological cycle. So the area that we have selected for this case study is the Paraná Basin. It's not the whole basin, the whole basin is marked here in red, but and here in, in yellow. <coughs> We selected a sub uh, a sub region in this in this basin, and this sub region we selected it has 36 Sentinel-2 tiles, uh, making it uh, 320,000 square kilometers. That is almost half of the France territory. Uh, we used the image from January 2018 to December 2021, so we had. Uh, 12,000 images to process that would take almost uh, 20 terabytes of memory if we had to download and store all these data. And how we did that to do to, to deal with this amount of uh, information, we had to improve the water detect package to work with the main clouds that are available. In this case, Microsoft Planetary Computer and Google Earth Engine. 
Microsoft Planetary Computer was used to download the band. So instead of download the whole image, we downloaded just the specific band that we need, just in time without the need for storing. And we use the Google Earth Engine because it has a very good uh, cloud mask that is called S2 Cloudless. It's a random forest machine learning process that was trained across the globe. And we use this uh, cloud to this uh, this cloud, the, the Google Earth Engine, to to get the clouds and to project the shadows, the cloud shadows in the ground. And we did it to work uh, in parallel with multiprocessing. So each mask was delivered for us in just one minute, and each mask is 100 by 100 kilometers in extension without the need to store uh, any partial products in the middle of the process. Still in this quantity analysis, after we had all these masks processed, we grouped the monthly masks using the median operator. So we had for the 36 tiles, so we have 36 times 48 because it's the number of months from 2018 to December 2021. So we have almost 1,800 high resolution masks combined in 48 uh, high resolution mosaics to process. This image is from January 2018, just to show that even during this processing, we still had pixels with no data information because of the persistence of clouds in the region. January, February are the, 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 the worst month, considering rains and, and clouds. So here in the worst scenario, we had cloud persistence of uh, 6%. So to deal with it, what was proposed, we filled the gaps with linear interpolation through time. So to do this, we, we converted the binary values into real numbers, downscaling the maps by a factor of 10. So each new pixel is composed by 10 by 10 pixels so that the new pixels represented the water percentage in one, one hectare. And we, when we had the gaps in time, we did the interpolation linearly. So we could produce 48 high resolution uh, uh, surface maps for the whole region for 320,000 square kilometers. And summing all the, the values, we have the area in hectares, and that's what we use to assess the, the, the surface water area in this test. To validate the results, we used, of course, the reservoirs monitored by the, the National Water Agency. <clears throat> they are here. We took just the ones with the stage curves. The results shown here in red, we have the results from the fields. So the ground truth is in red. In blue, we have the results from our remote sensing processing. We have a very good agreement, a very good coefficient of determination of 0.916. And what we can see here, I think I have a map here, yeah. What we can see here and here is that uh, we have usually an underestimation during high feeding periods, probably due to surrounding vegetation. It was discussed in the paper with the colleague from Kness. And also here in this specific test, we can have the problem with the cloud persistence and the interpolation, and we can be missing some extra <coughs> area during these high feeding periods, the rainy periods. So moving on with the surface analysis, we have the same analysis, but considering all the bodies in the region of interest, not only the 16 most, uh, the, the biggest ones. And when you do this, here in the top, we have the accumulated rain, considering the, the trim that's from radar. And here we have the water extent for the whole region. And in red, we have the alert that has been raised by the National Water Agency. It was in June uh, 2021. So officially, the drop started here. But if we look one year before the dry period of 2020, that it's here in November, we can see that we had a significant area loss during the dry, the 2020s dry season that ended here in November. So compared to the other dry season, we lost almost 7% of water surface here. 
and rainfall rates were lower than historical mean from September 20 to, uh, 2020 to September 2021, except for one month. So because of this, we had this really low feeding rate by Mars 2021 when the uh, reservoirs should be filled again. So we started the, the period uh, with a lower, 8% uh, lower area compared to the previous years. But if we look at the worst period that was here, November 2021, so it was the worst period for the drought, we have a, a very similar uh, value compared to the previous year, 2020. Uh, so even with these adverse events, the water in, in November 2021 remained, remained comparable to November 2020, which can highlight the efficacy of the efforts envisaged by the authorities to control water consumption in the basin, because from this point on, they imposed several restrictions to water use, usage in this basin. Uh, another kind of uh, spatial analysis that we propose in the third chapter is a strat stratified analysis where we took care of the size of the reservoir. So to do this, we used the, the water bodies inventory that's a, a vectorial data set that is available from the agency with almost 22,000 water bodies in the region of interest. And we keep track, we kept track of each water body above one hectare. So they were, they were tracked individually to see how the water surface was changing during this whole period from 2018 to 2021. <clears throat> and what we had as a finding, this is the, <clears throat> sorry, uh, this is the graph showing the loss in area considering that the, when they were most filled. In green, we have the smaller ones from 1 to 100 hectares. In red, we have medium. In blue, we have large above 10,000 hectares. And what we can see is that smaller water birds lost slightly more area than the biggest ones, minus 31% versus minus 25%. And that would raise us uh, some questions. For example, maybe that's lack of proper management in the smaller ones because they're the biggest ones were monitored and we had restrictions imposed. And medium-sized uh, reservoirs, we didn't see any change or any significant change. When we went to the data to check for the results, we saw that they were mostly run off river reservoirs, so they don't change uh, uh, size, so they don't have an accumulation uh, reservoir behind it. That's why the reds, they stay stable during the whole period. Still in the spatial analysis, another kind of analysis that we proposed was a in quantity analysis was the spatial analysis. To do this, we did a downscaling again with the pixels representing 250 by 250 pixels, very coarse pixels. We calculated the mean surface value for each one of these coarse pixels and its standard deviations. And we could provide maps of anomalies compared to the mean or to the other, to the other periods like this one. So, for example, here we have April 2020 compared to the mean, where it was supposed to be everything uh, blue. And we can see we had a, a shortage of water in Para Paranapanema Basin that it's located here. If we compare November 2020 to April 2020, we can see that most areas or the biggest reservoirs are all below the mean, but that, that's expected. But in April 2021, that was expected to be above the mean, we had issues uh, here, April 2021, yeah, we had issues in all major reservoirs in the region, and it was the ending of the rainy period, so we were expecting them to be filled. Uh, if we compare now the drought of 2021 to the drought of 2020, it's the last graph here, we can see that the northeast of the, the area of interest, we had mainly above average uh, accumulation or water surface and the 
and the dross was located mainly in these reservoirs in the west part, that's the Paraná River passing here. And what that gives us as insight is that the dross didn't affect the region uniformly. So if we are able to provide this kind of spatial analysis in large scale, we can have other insights and see how the regions are, uh, or how the drought, how the event, the, the critical event is performing. This is just another example of a solution uh, of a product that we provided at occurrence maps. This is also, we had that in 10 meter re resolution to see the water occurrence. That's good because we can see the filling areas and that's important for flood analysis. But that is just for as a sample of sub products that we can provide with this methodology. And now we enter in the water quality analysis. For the water quality analysis, we use the Paranapanema Basin. We didn't use the whole area. We used just the four tiles here. Oops, sorry. Okay. We use just the four tiles here in the bottom. They make up uh, 40,000 square kilometers, the same period. And why we did that? Because we needed some glints uh, processor, or we needed to attenuate the glints that exist in the image. And to do that, we use the glint removal for Sentinel that was developed by Tristan Harmel, a colleague here. And we did, we had this image just in this uh, smaller area here. What we use for the inversion algorithms for this for this part, we use the uh, algorithms from the literature. In this case, Turbidity to use a Dogliotti, it's the two band switching algorithm, depending if it is a high concentration or low concentration, it uses red or uh, near infrared. For chlorophyll, we use the Gitelson from 2011. And we did a very simple, for water quality analysis, we did a very simple uh, validation using stations. Oops, sorry. Using stations from the Environmental Agency of Sao Paulo State in Brazil that had B monthly measurements. We just don't have it here in 2020 because of the pan pandemic. But we, we have somehow a, a, a good. Uh, accuracy for, for these results, but we have to take also in consideration that here we are using 10 day windows because we don't have the image in the same dates we had the field measurement. And sometimes when we had these spikes, we thought they were outliers, but here is just a sample. If we look at the image, the original image, we can see that we probably had a flash event of sediments transportation in February 2016. And that's not, we cannot uh, get this kind of uh, event if you look just at the, the field measurements that are provided by the agency. So that's another important thing. <clears throat> With this algorithm, what we did, we, we did 48 maps like this one for chlorophyll and also for turbidity, and then we pass to the analysis. To analyze this data, what we, we proposed was a visualization like this one in using histograms. So here we have the median for each month. So here we have the, the median for each month, in this case for chlorophyll in milligrams per cubic meter. And a lot of things we can note from this graph. The first thing is that we have a monotonical increase in chlorophyll during these years from 2018 to 2021, from six to almost 12, a tripled increase in chlorophyll. <clears throat> for example, if we take the, the lower median for the chlorophyll concentration from 3.6 to 16, you have almost five, uh, 5, 4.5 fold increase in the chlorophyll. And <clears throat> If we look in each year, for example, years 2019, 2020, 2021, we can clearly see an increase in chlorophyll during the dry period 
that starts here in June. So they are there. It's very easy to see it here, and especially in June to uh, June to November and September, October 2020. If you do remember, to, uh, uh, September and October 2020 is when we had the huge drop in water extent in the graph, considering the, the whole basin. And the same for 2021, during the drop that started in June, we have a, 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 a severe increase in the values for these uh, curves. So moving on. We continued in a, in a stratified analysis to see how uh, smaller water bodies compared to uh, the biggest ones. To do this, we divided them in, in size, so we have uh, between in one and five hectares, between five and 10, 10 and 100 and above 100. And what we can see is that larger water bodies uh, uh, above 100 hectare, they show a greater impact in terms of eutrophication. Here is May 2018, where we have a high water storage. In red, we have the histogram for the higher, uh, for the larger water bodies. And it goes from 3.37 milligrams per cubic meter to uh, 16 here. And what happens with the smaller ones? What we see is that in smaller ones, the eutrophication is considerably higher during the whole period. That, that's what we can see from, from this graph. So smaller water birds so show a distinct dynamics with a negligible change in chlorophyll levels. And I just didn't mention here in the higher water residence time, that's the explanation for this increase, considering the larger water bodies for, for this increase in the, in the chlorophyll. But I will underline negligible change here, because if we look carefully in the tail of the histogram for the smaller ones, we can see that's basically the opposite to what happens with the, the larger ones. So from higher water storage, we have a higher occurrence with high values of uh, chlorophyll, and here we have a loss. And to show this better, here is the table with the chlorophyll levels uh, separated by quantiles, and here we have the size. And we can see that the higher values decrease during the dry periods. That's the opposite of what happens with the larger ones, that they increase from 3 to 16 or from 7 to 21. In the smaller ones, it occurs just the opposite. And that raises some questions or uh, raises some hypotheses. Uh, probably they are affected by distinct mechanisms when compared to larger reservoirs. Uh, one thing is that water retention times of smaller reservoirs not driven by the overall basin inflow. They have their own operation. And the other thing can be they, that the quick consumption of nutrients that are carried directly to the reservoirs during the rainy seasons, and this consumption is quick. And then that's why during the dry season, I have this diminution, uh, this uh, decrease in the, in, the, in the chlorophyll levels. This is uh, uh, shown here in these crops. This is exactly the, the same information. Here, small and very small from, uh, from Mars, where we have the rainy season. And here is the dry season of 2019. We can see that reservoirs, very small here, they become with lower levels of chlorophyll. That's the same with a medium sized reservoir. And that's exactly the opposite of what happens with larger ones. We did the same uh, proposition of visualization for the turbidity. What we can see in the turbidity is the opposite. So contrary to chlorophyll, we have an overall downtrend from 2018 to 2021. And if we look within each year, it's also the opposite. So during the dry season, we had lower concentration uh, of sediments and lower turbidity in the dry periods here. So that can give us as, as a hypothesis that rain is the main driver uh, bringing uh, sediments and turbidity to the basins. 
Another thing that is interesting here is the, the histograms are bimodal or multimodal, especially when we have uh, the rainy periods like January 2018 was especially rainy. And these multimodal histograms in higher median values evidence that turbidity, that turbidity does not affect uh, birds uniform, but shows spatial, spatially localized pattern with concentrated turbidity, especially in reservoirs intake. So here I took three images from Capivara, Jornal Mirim, Chavantes. There are big reservoirs in the region, and we can see that turbidity is mostly concentrated in the intakes of the reservoirs. And that's why they make those uh, histograms to be uh, bimodal. So, uh, as overall conclusion, as overall conclusion, I'd like to say that the, the present work permitted to address several challenges related to the use of remote sense for inland water birds assessments. In Axis 1, we provide a robust, scalable, and easy to use package for water detection. In Axis 2, that was not shown here, but it's in the thesis, we show the feasibility of employing a consistent number of tailored models to increase the parameters retrieve accuracy. In Axis 3, we proposed a comprehensive methodology for large-scale data treatment and highlighted new type of inland water analysis in terms of quantity and quality in regional scale. And considering prospects for, for the future course, let's say, for research, I would like to say that inland water assessment through remote sensing is still a challenge. Some domains need to, to more research and more improvements. For example, cloud and cloud shadow detection, especially over water. We don't have anything specific for, for uh, water. Atmospheric corrections focused in inland waters. The most important would be the glint correction to avoid outliers in our inversions of uh, quality parameters. The quality parameter inversion per C is a uh, one 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 path of, uh, of uh, increasing in, that we have to improve the research. And one that I think is one of the most important integration among tools it requires a lot of knowledge in different domains to be able to put everything to work together, considering high uh, clusters and high speed computing and packages to, to deal with specific scientific domains. And integration among these tools will be another a path to, to improve the research. And the last thing is that package and methodology developed here, we have a lot of, I didn't mention all of the packages that were developed through the thesis, water detection, water quality, radiometry, reuse, other, the, the downloaders, etc. They represent a step forward and they can serve as starting point for a fully operational framework. And that's much it. Thank you.